I'm now privileged to introduce David Jury, the head of the master's course, Art, Design, and the Book, at the Colchester Institute in England. Mr. Jury is the author of the lavishly illustrated new book entitled Graphic Design Before Graphic Designers. His book received a rave review in the New York Times from noted authority Stephen Heller, who commented, Jury, for his part, has outdone any other book I know that is devoted to this material. Through his keen selections and careful research, he powerfully presents the origin of today's graphic design. Mr. Jury has flown across the pond specifically to speak to us this morning about how job printers took on the task of graphic design, making artistic decisions before graphic design was recognized as a separate commercial activity. Please give our warmest ephemera society welcome to Mr. Jury. very much for that introduction and uh, thank you for um, uh, inviting me here. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay at the back. Um, this, is, uh, this talk is about jobbing printers. Uh, it's about how they worked and what they did and why they did it. Um, slide please. But first of all, I want to say something about this chap. I wonder if any of you, I'm sure most of you recognize this person. It's uh, John Lewis. Uh, famous uh, author and uh, collector of ephemera in Great Britain. And when I was a student in the 1960s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, there were so few books about graphic design, uh, but there were plenty of books by John Lewis. And for me, his books seemed to be about the history of graphic design. I didn't know what ephemera was and it didn't really mean anything to me at that time. But I was studying graphic design and his books were about graphic design, but Victorian graphic design. Later on, when I came back to his books, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I started reading the text that went with the images, and uh, I started to find a slightly different attitude uh, there in the text. Um, he had a sort of strange attitude to uh, the printers, to the producers of this ephemera. He would rave about the work. He would say how wonderful it was. Uh, but when it came to talking about the actual printers themselves. He had a slightly disparaging attitude. And I began to wonder where this, where this all came from. And being British, of course, there's a class system and there's a sense of designers are higher up than uh, printers, something like that perhaps was going on. We have to understand that um, John Lewis was a tutor <clears throat> at the Royal College. Uh, he was a tutor on one of the first graphic design courses in the UK. And in his book on graphic design and on that particular course, he described the work of uh, jobbing printers as a kind of peasant art. Now, you could sort of see that as a sort of compliment. Um, personally, I can't. I don't. I can't see any. I can't see any reason why being a peasant is considered to be a, a good thing. Um, I've got to try and. Uh, I want to find a, a. I want to explain to you what he actually said. This is what he said about um, uh, the book that he produced, printed ephemera. I'm sure most of you have copies of this. On the paperback version, page six, he says this. Most of the illustrations in this book that date from before 1900 are the products of, an unsophist of unsophisticated printers. Such 20th century work, as is shown here, comes from the drawing boards and layout pads of designers who are anything but unsophisticated. So you have it pretty well in a nutshell. It's pretty clear what he was thinking there. Now, let me just say once again that if it hadn't been for uh, John Lewis, I would never have been interested in this material in the first place, and there's no doubt that he was a major force in the um, collection of ephemera, particularly in Great Britain. But it's a strange attitude. So I want to uh, try and disprove that. That's the main thrust of this talk and the main reason that I uh, did the book. Uh, graphic design before graphic design. It's, it's to prove that printers surely, surely must have been intelligent people to have come up with some of those solutions that they did. Um, a very good friend of mine, I know some of you know him, um, uh, John Hall, who is the treasurer of the UK Ephemera Society, was tremendously helpful to me. Um, 
By the way, he was taught by John Lewis, uh, interestingly enough. Um, this particular work is, uh, and, then, and the next slide as well, is um, from a book that was a sort of scrapbook that was put together by an apprentice letterpress, a uh, jobbing printer. When I say an apprentice, we're talking about maybe 13, 14 year old, you know, I don't know his age, uh, but this was in 1891. And it's a sort of scrapbook that's been, where he stuck bits and pieces over the top of text. The original book was uh, a type specimen book. And he just uh, put all this material over the top. And it was clear that, uh, it's quite clear that as the book progresses, the work that he's doing becomes more sophisticated. This is, not, this is not graphic design. This is preparing yourself to be a graphic designer. This is the kind of thing that graphic design students do on a course, a, a degree course today. This kind of cutting, pasting, testing for uh, uh, different kinds of, for scale, for weight, and so on. Um, to me, this sort of proves that this is a thinking person. This is someone who's really beginning to analyze the way color works, the way scale works, the way texture, and the way you use abstract uh, negative spaces as well as positive spaces. It convinces me that this is an intelligent person. The chap's name is Walter Bunn. I have no idea what happened to Walter Bunn, so uh, I'd love to be able to tell you. Please. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what the jobbing printer did and where he did it and how he did it. There are two main areas of printing. I know there's lithography as well, but I'm going to sort of ignore lithography just to keep things simpler. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about letterpress and engraving. Okay. As a nice contrast, really good contrast. And those two processes uh, have been with uh, printing almost from the beginning of uh, any kind of mechanical printing process. Letterpress. This is a compositor's uh, room, composing room. I suspect it's a very large uh, newspaper uh, come uh, magazine sort of uh, uh, company. Um, look at the amount of space that workers have. Very little. <clears throat> very little. Very tight. There's no work surfaces available to them. Uh, they're working in teams. They've probably got, uh, I don't know if you know how these things work, but they have a sort of a group of five or six who works the team, so when a clump of text needs to be set, maybe 10,000 words, each compositor will be given, say, uh, 2,000 each, and um, they'd, be, they'd all work to a set sort of grid, a set rule, and the work would, would be put together by these guys on the side here who, who are doing the actual imposition. They're actually taking the chunks of text, putting them next to each other, underneath each other, and sort of fixing them into a frame, so that it would then be transferred to a, a press. So teamwork is very important. <clears throat> in other words, I think the point I'm trying to make here <clears throat> is that there's very little room for individuality in an old composing workshop such as this. I want to contrast with uh, this image, which is of a design studio. It happens to be in France. happens to be in an advertising agency. Um, very different um, sense of place, a very sense of, uh, sense of space. It's quiet. It's contemplative. It's been staged, of course, uh, just like the previous shop probably was too, uh, but more staged, I think. Uh, these are people who, um, they know they've been photographed and then they know that they're trying to get across a certain aspect. So they're trying to explain to people what design is and what its value is. And part of its value is that intellectual aspect. So you have people here talking to each other, um, uh, discussing something, pointing. Um, each person has their own workspace, their own desk, with their own paraphernalia. It isn't tidy, but at the same time, it's not crazily untidy, such as like the composing room is in the previous slide. <clears throat> I think we're missing quite a lot of the slide on the right-hand side here, actually. I'm sure. If... Anyway, we'll go on to the next slide and see... Yeah, we are. Anyway, never mind. I think we'll manage. Uh, this is an interesting image, I think, because uh, same time, around 1920, um, maybe I think you might, some of you might be interested in this. It's an American company, printing company, um, and the idea is that uh, 
by the beginning of, I think it's 1919, something like that, by this time printers were beginning to think that uh, the kind of service that they provided needed to be in the whole. It needed, it needed to include things like photography, things like a different kind of printing processes, finishing processes, but also design. There came a time, uh, round about, just after the First World War, when printers began to realize they had to be designers as well. And this is the kind of image that they thought represented design. And I want you to compare this with the French image that you saw just two pictures earlier. First of all, there's no interaction. Uh, the next, they're all pointing the same way. They're all working, they've got their heads down. There's a different kind of attitude here. There isn't that intellectual uh, interaction between them going on here. Um, there's something rather false about this photograph, actually. I, I've always thought that maybe it was just set up purely for the photograph, uh, and maybe then it was dismantled, I don't know. The closeness of the, uh, this guy's table here, uh, bottom left, uh, so close to the edge of the steps and so on. It seems, uh, I, I, you know, something's going <clears> to, <throat> there's going to be a nasty accident any minute. <laughs> I can't help thinking. Interestingly, <clears throat> you see what they're wearing. It's exactly the same as the guys in the composing workshop in the uh, first photograph. Uh, the black um, um, waistcoat, yeah, and the white shirt, and the rolled up sleeves. I can't help thinking these people were dragged out of the composing room and just told to sit here for five minutes. I don't know. Um, this is complete contrast now. This is uh, uh, an engraving workshop. It happens to be Italy, 1920-ish. Uh, it's very grubby, isn't it? Very messy and grubby and dirty. <clears throat> um, but I'd much rather work in this place than in the composing room. Uh, there's a quietness about it, uh, natural light coming through, a lot of visual reference. Um, again, it's been set up because you can see the chap there who's got his face facing the window. He's, he's moved the work around so you can, you can actually see it. And you can see that he's making a, a copy of the painting that's in front of him. Okay. <clears throat> uh, another photograph of engraving, just to show you something that's... Uh, Okay, we think of engravers as being um, engraving artists. In fact, they were always called artists, interestingly enough. Um, but there is another side to engraving, which is this sort of uh, rather more mechanical, very difficult and technically demanding process of copying music. Uh, letterpress always struggled to print music. It's, to find a way of doing that using letterpress uh, is very difficult to do. That's okay, that was good timing. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about process. Uh, this is going to link up with the uh, presentations this afternoon, I think. Uh, I had a sort of vague idea of what was going on during the day, but uh, I'm hoping I'm not stepping on too many people's toes here uh, by showing these photographs. Letterpress uh, is made up of really of units that are already manufactured. A letterpress compositor has to use what is given. Uh, unlike an engraver where you can almost create anything at all, any kind of letter form and any kind of shape and any kind of size, uh, the letterpress person is, has to work with whatever the foundry, the type foundry gives him. Okay. This is what it looks like when it's been uh, composed. Uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, I composed this actually. Uh, but, you know, I, I say that, uh, and, and I can say it looks beautiful, but in actual fact, of course, the whole stuff, all this stuff was made by Monotype, Monotype Corporation. Monotype Corporation cut the typefaces, Monotype manufactured those uh, units, and uh, also gave me the spacing before between the characters, between the uh, words and so on. So how much of it was mine and how much of it was Monotype? And this is the problem with the compositors have. This is what the problem letterpress artists, designers printers have always had, that you're having to work with material that's given to you in one form or another. So of course there are certain limitations built into the process. In contrast, this is an early uh, engraving, it's not a really engraving is it, it's not quite got to that point, but this is an apprentice trying maybe for the first time 
I mean, why we still have this plate, God only knows. But I guess maybe it was this apprentice's first day on the job. And he was asked to uh, do some very simple tasks. And unfortunately, uh, we are missing, every, all, all down the right-hand side, we're missing chunks of the slide. And on, on this plate, which is only about three inches high, three inches high, in the bottom right-hand corner is a series of little lines, which have obviously been made by the master. And the master has said to the printer, right, you do the same, and I want you to carry on all the way up the plate until you get to the top. And similarly, um, can you go back again? Sorry. It's OK. Um, similarly with the um, uh, sort of round, <coughs> what would you say, so curved lines. And the idea was to make a series of curved lines, all the same distance apart, all the same weight, all the same uh, thickness of cut. And it was that kind of dexterity, that sort of very basic element of how to cut into metal and control what it is you're doing that, was, that is the essence of the engraver. And I think it's really interesting to see an early plate like this because we can all look at that and think, yes, I'd, I'd be lucky to be able to do something as good as that on my first day, you know? Um, but it also tells us something about why, you know, the, the, um, what an engraver like this at the very first day is trying to do. There's a little bit there up on the top right-hand corner that we can still see. I don't know if you can make that out, but it's actually leaves. It's a little sprig of leaves. And this guy is clearly thinking, uh, this is tedious. Why am I being asked to do this tedious task of just repeating the same thing over and over? When really, you know, I'm quite a good artist. I can actually do stuff. Uh, and he started to almost, I think, of making a point that, uh, to the tutor. Why am I being asked to do this? I love those kind, these sort of little um, suggestions of, of what it was to be a jobbing printer at that time, so many years ago of that age. Because again, apprentices started at 10, 11, 12 years of age. Okay. And of course, this is what you're aiming for. And the reason you're being asked to repeat those lines over and over is so that you can do work like this, where you've got those in lines inside the type, uh, all exactly the same weight, all the same distance apart. Beautiful piece of work. Um, uh, the change of scale and everything is a bit bizarre here, but you can see a thumb mark there, look top left hand. So you can see that these, uh, these letters are about an inch high. So it's pretty incredible stuff, just from a technical point of view. OK. Now, the essence of uh, engraving is drawing. If you can't draw, you can't engrave. I mean, yes, you can cut into metal. But whether you're going to cut into metal and actually be able to describe something uh, is another another question. So you have to be able to draw first of all, and so the engraver, apprentice engraver did a lot of drawing like this, and depending on the time and the place, uh, it was quite common to be asked to uh, devise these kind of monograms. Um, today's version of a logo, if you like, yeah, we call them a logo today, but in those days, uh, those sort of entwined uh, characters, which somehow always seem to suggest the idea of strength in unity, you know? Um, of you know, vines sort of wrapping around each other, and that's what makes it strong. Uh, and so you'd have images like this, which also go back to sort of medieval uh, period and so on. Uh, these are tiny drawings. Uh, again, these were in a scrapbook uh, by, that John Hall found. So the same thing as with the letterpress, but this time it's engraving, and it's all drawing. Uh, and I guess there were drawings that were done by different people. It wasn't just by the same engraver. So this person is looking around and learning from what other people are doing. This bit of paper, you can see it's been folded in half. So these things look really complicated, but like most of these things, when you've got a tutor uh, showing you how to do things and you've got to make a living, things have to be done fairly efficiently, and uh, you only have to draw one side of this and then uh, fold it over and rub, rub on the other side and it transfers the image and so on. I'm sure we've all done that, that kind of work before. Um, NAC and E, H, E are the two, uh, are the characters that they're having to use. Okay, I don't know if you can actually make out NAC, it's pretty difficult. And there's a sense of fun in these things, which I, I think is fascinating. This is as if the apprentices were sort of testing each other and, and trying to outdo each other. Uh, to do something inventive, even amusing. Beautiful drawing. And, and this is almost um, something else. This is not really... 
I'm not even sure this is a drawing that was done to be an engraving. I think it maybe it was a drawing that was done and, and the, the engraver saw it, found it, liked it and just saved it. But you can understand why engravers were called artists. They, were, um, they needed to be able to draw and it was that aspect of marks on paper, I think, which made that association so much easier to be made. Um, there are two images here. The one on the right uh, is a drawing and the one on the left is an engraving. And um, the one on the left, and, and on my original si slide, I've got the whole, the whole drawing, okay, so. Yeah, I don't know what happened there, this is. Yeah, it's all right, I know, but, uh, I, know, I know, don't worry, I don't know, it's like before. Um, the thing is that I, I included this because I think it explains why drawing, one of the reasons drawing was so important, not only to create things, but also to explain to a client what it was you were doing. And also maybe to suggest that, uh, yes, you're a capable uh, person, uh, to be able to uh, produce whatever it is the client wanted. So here we have uh, an engraving on the left of um, an invite of some sort, and you'll not notice the date. The drawing on the right uh, has a date that's the year later. So why was the drawing produced? It wasn't produced for, the, for this particular engraving. And I guess, uh, I speculate, that maybe uh, the engraving on the left was taken to another engraver by the client to see if maybe they could get a, a cheaper job or maybe they just want to try someone else, just like we do today. You know, you want to test the water and see if you can get a job done as good but by someone else and maybe a little cheaper. So the drawing on the right hand side is an exact copy of the one on the left, but of the engraving on the left, but with the date changed. So it seemed like a very elaborate piece of work to do when all you had to do was change the date. That's the strange thing. That's what I like about print ephemera and uh, ephemera in general. There's lots of stories inside the material if you can just, uh, you know, when you start to look for it. Why was it produced? It's very strange. Or it might have just been an apprentice, you know, just trying things out and uh, just for the sake of it, uh, just trying to show what he could do, but we don't know. So, engraving, uh, great, uh, to be an engraver, uh, it, you can only be as good an engraver as you were a drawer. If your draftsmanship is poor, you're going to be a poor engraver. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, trade card. It was printed in Germany, but the client, I guess, was English or maybe Welsh, I don't know. Um, the strange thing about this is, uh, can you see the figure in the front uh, and the characters in the canoe at the, uh, in the water? Um, I'm not saying this is a very good engraving, I don't think it is, in fact, but uh, the figure that's been drawn looks as though it's been added later. It looks very stiff and almost like a stick figure. And the scale is all wrong too. He looks far too small. Um, so I guess what's happened here is one engraver's done the card and then this uh, chap, W. Jones, who was an artist, uh, maybe Jones himself thought that he could put himself in there and um, have this character sort of pointing at the name on the uh, inscribed stone, I don't know. Um, Thomas Wyatt, uh, this is as good as it gets, okay? I wanted to show you this in comparison. This is, uh, Thomas Wyatt was, uh, his head of the, uh, at the age of 23, he was head of the Royal, head of the Royal Mint, uh, the Royal, uh, uh, yes, the Royal Mint. So his ability to engrave coins and, uh, uh, other sort of related material uh, engravings for paper money uh, meant that when he came to do his card, it's really sublime. It's uh, a really superb piece of work, very complicated, uh, beautiful texture. One of the big things about engravers that letterpress people couldn't do, of course, was that they could bend letters, they could make it any shape they liked and uh, make it any size. Um, and it's particularly useful for map making, as you can see. And then this, that sort of uh, skill could be uh, applied to uh, jobbing cards like this, uh, trade cards. And um, I want to just point out the Kenton Bale uh, lettering on the top there. Uh, why he would do something as complicated as that on an engraving that also shows all these other sort of different typefaces uh, around the site is quite interesting. I think it's because of the influence of uh, 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 sign writers who were very prevalent at the time. This is from a set of 15 cards, 15 sheets. Some of you might 
have one of these. I don't know. It's from a Swedish uh, printing company. It is. It says Litho. Uh, but these were produced, I think, to be uh, put on the wall in maybe colleges where uh, type, um, uh, sign writing was uh, being taught. Uh, painting and decorating courses also um, included things like sign writing. Uh, I, I remember seeing uh, students in the 1960s uh, who would each have a door, and each, in the panel of each door would be a different kind of um, effect. It could be stone, it could be uh, marble, different kinds of wood. And they had to, the skill of a, an interior de decorator at that time was that you're able to suggest these different sort of uh, processes, these different sort of surfaces, as an as a interior designer. So, of course, this sort of work was ideal for uh, shop faces. And the kind of uh, flexibility that a sign writer had to be able to manipulate type into any size and any color was, you know, must have been very frustrating to not only the letterpress printer, but also the engraver. The trouble is, so little of this remains because uh, they were put up outside shops and 50 years later they fell down and that's the end of it. You know, we don't have, we have very little reference material. In fact, the best reference material we have is stuff like this, which, which was produced by printers for sign writers to look at. Uh, famous, not a famous book, uh, a, a book that was engraved uh, specifically to show uh, different typefaces that sign writers were using from different parts of the world. It's Italian. Uh, and if any, any of you are in, uh, ever lucky enough to be close to Venice, uh, there's a Tipoteca Italiano Museum. Uh, which is only about 40 miles uh, west of Venice, and it's really worth uh, visiting Their archives are fantastic. And if you tell them you're from the uh, uh, Ephemeral Society of America, I'm sure you'll get a guided tour and be able to get into the library and, and have a look at their collection. It's really fantastic. This is what letterpress printers had to work with uh, in the 17th, uh, 18th century. Uh, the typefaces are designed for books. This is the problem which, with the jobbing printer, letterpress jobbing printer. This is the material he had. There's nothing else. Uh, very, very limited. And it wasn't until uh, 1815 when suddenly uh, uh, there was a sort of flourish of uh, new typefaces that came out uh, in Britain from different foundries. Mainly Vincent Figgins was the first one. Okay, double page spread. These books are um, pocket size. I don't know why they were so small. Perhaps it's to do with the printing, uh, that, uh, but they were so small that it meant that a larger typeface, you'd maybe only get one character of the whole face. And you, when you're deciding which typefaces to buy as a printer, uh, you'd only have um, maybe three or four or one character. That's what you've got to see here. Very dramatic. And the difference in these typefaces was immediately recognised by printers as being something they could use. Um, on the left-hand side, we have... Um, uh, an alphabet, little alphabet book for uh, Battle Dorm, I think they were called, um, for children. And for that, they would use Fat Face, which is the characteristics of Fat Face, very friendly, very charming, very lively. And on the right hand side, you've got part of uh, a poster for boxing. And of course, we've got your slab serif, uh, you know, very heavy, sort of physical sort of typeface. So using the typeface to say different things, to, uh, to inform people about the nature of the material as well as uh, the process. Harpal typograph uh, is a major change, a revolution if you like. Harpal's typograph was a book uh, produced in, nine, in 1870 by Osk, Oscar Harpal, a uh, Cincinnati printer. And it came from nowhere. Uh, on the right hand side there's another book, uh, which I'm sorry you can't all see, but uh, that's what books looked like in those days. It was very simple, just black and white. Everything's very centered. Um, all the type is the usual sort of book type that we've just been talking about. Harpel, Harpel's book, okay, apart from the fact that it's centered, in every other respect, this is entirely uh, revolutionary. No one's ever seen color being used like this by a letterpress printer. And here's a spread from it. And fortunately, we've got the left, the left hand side page, which is the better side of this uh, slide. <laughs> um, and you know, I look at this, and I think this could, be, this could have been done today. 
I was in Greenwich yesterday walking down that one, one of those high streets, you know, these sort of fancy stores, very expensive. And this kind of material here, what that wine list, that, that image and the words wine list, is, I, I'm not going to say it's beautiful, but we're talking about 1870 here. This is uh, a piece of work by a printer, and I just don't know where this material comes from. It's just amazing. Uh, what happened with, with this book, if you're not aware of the book, is that Oscar Harple uh, went around all the printers in his vicinity and got the different printers to give him uh, maybe, I don't know how many books he printed, someone else, someone here will know. Say it was a thousand books, he asked for a thousand copies of that particular piece of work. Uh, or I think he had um, uh, stereos made from the originals and he printed them up himself. Um, but the idea is that it's work by genuine printers of the time, uh, not just him. And that was a very interesting concept. This is the very first book where we have jobbing work actually being put together in one, uh, in one book. It's genuine, ordinary work, not flan fancy sort of highfalutin work. It's ordinary, uh, boring work like menus and little invites and so on. A fascinating book. And very rare these days. Uh, uh, the copy that we have in London at the St. Bride is falling to bits. And uh, you know, if any of you have a copy and it's in reasonable condition, I don't know what it's worth, but it must be worth a lot. It's very valuable from the point of view of history of graphic design, that's for certain. Because it is the first graphic design book, even though it's produced by a printer. Uh, just to say that, uh, okay, the printing process itself was getting simpler. I mean, this machine here uh, could be done by, run by one person. Uh, this particular machine could do two colours at the same time, but that's slightly beside the point. The thing is, it's a Trevor press, and the idea is that uh, registration it was getting easier and easier. So those sort of complex colours that you saw in the Harpo uh, book, that sort of work has been made easier because of machines like this. Um, there's a lot of talk after Harpo about where printing could go from there. It took about 10 years, and there's a lot of argument, a lot of discussion between America and England, uh, because there was a lot of talk about there being an international uh, book of some sort that pulled together this material that, uh, that uh, letterpress, uh, letterpress compositors were beginning to uh, work on. They were proud of what they were doing. Uh, they knew that it was, it was valuable, they knew that it was important, but it was a way of finding a way of, of getting it out there. <coughs> In the end, it fell to um, uh, a chap named Andrew Tewer in England, Andrew White Tewer, uh, to become the editor of this uh, particular book. And the idea is uh, very similar to Harpo, that say you have 200 books, you have 200 books, so, sorry, 200 people who sign up to take part in this, you ask them all to send 200 copies of the same piece of work, and then you uh, put those, uh, all that work together as 200 different books, and that person would receive a copy of the book with their single piece of work in it, plus 199 ex examples of other people's work. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, those of you that know about this, and I know there's some of you that know a lot about this particular uh, set of books, um, I'm rushing a little bit, so, um, anyway, okay. Um, on the right-hand side there, um, there's a terrible piece of work. You can't see very much of it, but it is pretty poor, I have to say. Uh, the interesting thing about the Printers International Specimen Exchange, uh, and the way the Tua did it, was that he wanted to include bad work as well as good work. That's a really interesting idea. You know, as a tutor, I'm, I like showing students good, um, I like stu showing students bad professional work because uh, there's so much to analyze, there's so much to, it's so much more fun to analyze why something doesn't work uh, than it is about why something works. And it's oft often easier, to be honest. <laughs> um, Tua, this is one of the big arguments at the time, uh, it was Tua that insisted that who wanted to include everything. If a, if a printer wanted to be involved in this book, then he was going to let them uh, put work in there. And the piece of work on the right hand side there, you can't see very much of it, but it is uh, just, you know, it's tedious in the extreme. The other thing is that Tua was asking them to uh, provide genuine um, uh, jobbing work, okay? Uh, most of them ignored that and just put in these sort of uh, single page adverts for themselves, which is the, what you can see on the right hand side. Uh, in the same book, uh, we have examples of work like this from America. 
And this is what it's all about. This is what Chua wanted to have in his book, and the reason he wanted to have it in the book was to show British printers what needed to be done. This is the standard, this is the excellence, uh, the uh, par excellence of the time. Uh, 1880, I know yeah, 1880 this book was produced. And I think, personally, this is the best page in the book. Uh, it's the best piece of work. Uh, it's by a chap named uh, Earhart. And um, it's for the Franklin Cincinnati Tap Foundry. <clears throat> it's a card. What you have to understand is what you're looking at here is a page, and the whole page has been printed, and um, so what you see on the, on the top there, it looks like it's stuck on, but actually it's been printed, and then the colour behind has been put on so that you can see the edge of the card without having to draw a line around it, without having to have a black rule around it. It's a beautiful piece of work. I mean, not only is it technically superb, but uh, it's always amazed me that when it came to putting that colour on the background, Instead of it being straight, he actually included sort of rough line, as if it had just been casually sort of painted on. It's an amazing thing to do at that time. And it also provides that sort of visual contrast with the immaculate uh, printing of the uh, card itself. <clears throat> the colours, look at the colours. So many colours, I don't know how many colours there are there. And the colours are all mixed. There's no colour that's come straight out of the tin. They've all been carefully thought about, carefully analysed, carefully chosen. And this is the one that most people reproduce because it's the most bizarre. It's the most outlandish. And uh, my daughter, who's a great fan of the 1950s, she's got a picture of this on a wall in the kitchen. It's just got that out-of-this-world look about it. I mean, in 18, imagine what people thought about that in 1870. And you have to imagine this in the same book alongside all these little uh, invites to uh, garden fates and uh, tea garden, you know, stuff like that. And suddenly you have this amazing, dramatic, energetic piece of work. And it's not completely, you know, it's not a silly piece of work because here the printer is saying uh, the sun is a symbol of energy, a symbol of creativity, and that's why he's included that. And I'm sorry you can't see the whole image, but it is the sun and you've got the decorative elements around the outside which are obviously suggestive of uh, clouds. The only thing that tells us for certain that it's 1870 is the type in the middle. Everything else about it means it could have been anything uh, up to the present day. Just two examples of um, classic artistic printing. This is uh, what this material was called. They, for some reason, they called themselves artistic printers. Uh, that word artistic is very important. They did think of themselves as being, as producing something that was genuinely more than just uh, something to be thrown away. That it had an intrinsic value. And the idea was, it just came, it all comes from Harple. Harple was the one who said, no matter how humble, how simple the piece of work is, uh, whatever it is you do, you should always do it to your absolute best ability. Even if it's only going to last for seconds, it doesn't matter. What you have to do is uh, produce the best you can. And I think this kind of work uh, shows that. This is uh, work by an English uh, company. This is in volume 10 of the Printers uh, International Exchange. Um, I don't know what you think about this. Uh, I got the impression maybe, maybe you're slightly impressed. Uh, I wouldn't be too over-impressed by this. It's, um, this is English. Uh, it's Wraithby and Lawrence, um, very well-known printing company, and they took over the management of the uh, uh, Printers Exchange in, after, I think, Volume 8, so Volume 9 from there onwards is Wraith and Lawrence. And um, they were big fans of Earhart the American printer that we showed earlier. And uh, the whole of this is just a complete takeoff of the American style of artistic printing. It's beautifully done, it's immaculate, it's a whole page. And I think because uh, it's volume 10 and it's only uh, uh, two issues in to what they were producing, I think they felt they needed to have, make a statement about their own company. And this is what they produced. But it's all very on the coattails of the American printers at the time. I must say something, though, about... Are we running out? No. OK. OK, that's good. We're all right. Um, two English printers who I greatly admire. Uh, on the right-hand side, I'm sorry you can't see any more of that book, but on the right-hand side is Chua's book. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about that. On the left is uh, Haley, Thomas Haley. Uh, Haley, along with Chua, was the 
these two guys were the ones who really made the uh, printer's exchange work. Uh, Haling, this is one of his circulars, and uh, he produced 24 of these, I think. And um, they're very much ahead of their time. In England, this stuff must have looked quite bizarre at the time. Uh, we look at it today, and it could have come from um, you know, just the last, the last year or so. I've seen digital typography that's very similar to this. Maybe the digital technology, the digital types are actually copies of this material. Who knows? Um, but it has a very contemporary look about it. But you mustn't be swayed by that. Uh, Thomas Haling, when you look at the work inside this, uh, this journal that he produced, and you look at his own books of specimens, type specimens, um, he never really engaged with artistic printing as such. He was all about quality, of course, but this kind of style uh, that you can see on the cover is this only ever appeared on the covers of these circulars. But I do like them a lot. They're all the same. They all have different typefaces. Each one features a different typeface. And the same typeface is used on the masthead as well, which is quite unusual. Um, the book on the right is uh, by Andrew Chua. Um, and he was uh, a really interesting guy. Again, uh, not an artistic printer at all. His main theme was uh, improving the quality of printing in England. Okay, and that was the main reason he set up the uh, Printers Exchange. His own work was um, all kinds of publishing, uh, books of various kinds, um, books on vellum, printed on vellum, very high quality uh, printing, as well as a lot of advertising that he got involved with. So he was a classic jobbing printer, but who also did a lot of uh, printing of books. And the books that he produced, I think, are you know, collector's items. The one on the right you can see is uh, a book of... Um, uh, songs and fairy tales, um, uh, ballads and so on, and illustrated by Joseph Cawhorn, um, great illustrator, who became very influential in the early 20th century of graphic design. Another favourite of mine is an American uh, printer, um, Conrad Lutz. And if anyone knows anything about Conrad Lutz, I'd love to speak to you about it, because uh, every time I see his work, I really like it. And it always seems to me that he was the epitome of the artistic printer. He had the artistic inte uh, integrity about him. Um, but this um, willingness to try anything, no matter how crazy, uh, is always there in his work. Every time I see something, it's something strange that he's done. And I, I really admire that. The, the bit on the bottom here, I have to explain to you, that's really tiny. It's a small detail of, um, of a page of work that he did. And um, it includes this uh, two, pr two passes of blue, two passes of yellow, and then a pass of the uh, adhesive onto which the uh, gold sprinkles would have been sprayed. It's a very strange thing to do. But classic Lutz, you know, uh, weird and wonderful and slightly silly. Just going to say a little bit about the demise of the artistic printer. Um, it's very sad, really. Uh, why, did, why did it happen? Um, I purposely put this slide on after the Lutz because I wanted to show you the craziness that, the, of the extent that one would go to with artistic printing and then to compare it with the seriousness and intent of uh, these guys. Yeah. In the middle here we have uh, John Ruskin. Uh, John Ruskin was the, uh, the leader and the propagator, if you like, of the arts and crafts movement. And on his left is uh, Rossetti, the artist and illustrator. And on the right is um, William Scott Bell. John Ruskin was a very influential guy. Tua was a big admirer of uh, Ruskin, as virtually everybody was. And um, when it came to setting up the uh, Prince's Exchange, he tried to get Ruskin to uh, put a few words down that he could use in the introduction. Uh, he did eventually come up with a, a quote that Chua could use, but uh, I've always read this quote as being slightly uh, disparaging. Uh, everybody, most people seem to think that it's perfectly okay, but um, let me read to you what he said. Uh, this is what uh, Ruskin said and what Chua uh, wrote in his introduction. Life could be, could be whole only when the beauty of nature, art and craft infused everyday life and objects. That's a good description of ephemera. Um, but he also said that uh, he felt that um, when a printer occasionally, or shall we say, sometimes, uh, 
was able to produce work of a certain standard. That's all well and good. But what he was concerned with was that the purpose of the artistic printing, the jobbing printer, was to sell manufactured goods. Okay? And he was absolutely against manufactured goods of any sort of, of any kind. He wanted goods that were handmade. And so he always saw the jobbing printer as being intrinsically a negative act activity. Yes, on the one hand, it's print that's going to be out there and for everyone to use, and that's very important. But the trouble is you're always selling the equivalent of baked beans. You know, and, and where's the honour and the integrity in that? That was his problem. And so uh, he provided this sort of quote for true to use, but um, it's rather disparaging, I think. The other issue with artistic printing uh, is that... Um, it was, they were capable of becoming quite lazy. Um, they were encouraged to be. I mean, obviously, time is money and all the rest of it. But the problem here is that uh, you have these what are called combination borders, combination sets, where uh, it, it, a set would have a theme. It could be uh, Egyptian, it could be Indian, it could be, uh, um, in this case, Chinese. And you get these sort of uh, decorative borders, but you also get these individual characters, such as the lady with the parasol, and suddenly, uh, because of the success of these combination borders, these have been sold all over the world, um, you can get a printer in Scotland, in the top one, um, and a printer in New York, using exactly the same material and producing work that's very, very similar. It's just not on. From a design point of view, you know that the client needs something that's specific to their needs. And the process was evolving so that the artist or printer was beginning to use material that was available to everyone. And it, wasn't, it didn't have that specific specificity anymore. Um, same block. You, you know, you've got someone uh, trying to sell uh, a card for a coal and wood merchant and someone who's selling uh, sewing machines. This kind of work. It's very, very easy for an advertising agency and say to the client, you know, these printers, they don't know what they're doing. This isn't marketing. This is something else. It's just very, very lazy work. And this is the sort of image that the advertising agency would provide for the letterpress printer on the left-hand side. He does look very isolated, doesn't he? He looks as if he's behind bars almost with his sort of cracked windows and uh, he's still got his that sort of um, eye shield and so on. Uh, on the right-hand side, you've got an image. This was taken from a, an actual little advert for um, an advertising agency. And it's a guy in a top hat with two cases. And one says designs and copy, and the other one says plans. And it's, it's, the, you know, it's crude and it's horrible. But what it's doing is it's sort of selling uh, the, um, the ideas, the idea of uh, an advertising agency to a client who's looking to make money. Basically saying, look, we're on your side. These printers are outmoded. Their processes are outmoded. We know what it is you need, and we can provide it. Printers can't. And, um, of course, the Bauhaus was the epitome of that. So now we're into the 1919. 1919. Um, this image on the left-hand side, I quite like it because it reminds me of the in images we have of the engraver. And when the engraver could mix uh, words and images so easily, you can do the same thing with photography, and the same thing is going on here. It's a very sort of sophisticated image, but using photography, which is the new language, the new technology, has that sort of scientific reality about it that people were beginning to like, particularly after the First World War. Walter Gropius. Okay, Walter Gropius, designer, businessman. That's what this image says. Okay, I never believed that, particularly in the 1920s, when a photograph like this is taken, there's such a palaver to do it. That's been carefully put together. And he's saying, you know, I'm a designer, but I'm also a professional. I know what it is you want. I'm of the modern world. This is what the Bauhaus was all about. And part of that was to denigrate, unfortunately, what the printer was doing. Because effectively, they were taking the design off the printer and getting the client to pay for that separately. Is that okay? I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.